know, the thing is that believing in the resurrection requires you to believe in, a, in an incredible miracle. And some people have trouble with that. I get that. But if you can be open to the possibility that it's true, that this story is true, Jesus rose on the third day, the story gives you all the reasons in the world to believe that, in fact, it is true. It is one of the best attested facts of history. I mean, usually in history, we have to go by single sources, more often than not by single sources, often uh, written centuries after the event. Like, for example, most of what we know about Alexander the Great comes from one source. It's a historian named Livy, who was writing about four centuries after Alexander the Great lived. That's not untypical for, for history. Well, when it comes to Jesus, and now particularly his resurrection, we've got the four Gospels all written, written within one generation of the event. And those four Gospels, if you subject them to all the standard sort of tests that historians subject ancient documents to, to verify how reliable they are, they pass those tests with flying colors. So we've got four very early sources. We know that they're not just copying one another because their accounts are all somewhat different. Uh, they're, they're not all completely harmonious. And then we've got the Apostle Paul. He experiences the risen Lord, and he, 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 he uh, reports about a dozen other names, a dozen other people who witnessed the resurrected Christ, and then alludes to the 500 people, more than 500, who saw him at one time, as if to say, if you don't believe me, check out these, these other folks. This is very well attested in history. This is about as good as history ever gets. And then on top of that, there's this. This is one, I think, one of the strongest arguments for the resurrection. How do you explain how these monotheistic Jews... Raised in Judaism, and the fundamental tenet of their faith is that God is up in heaven, humans are down here, and never the two are the same. God is not a human. And yet we find that Jesus made such an impression on them that by the end of his ministry, when he ascends to heaven, they are seeing him as God on earth, the embodiment of Yahweh. One of their contemporaries is, is Yahweh embodied. How do you explain how these Jews, against everything they were ever taught, the way they were raised, their culture, they are worshiping this human being. That's considered blasphemy in Judaism. They're worshiping and praying to this human being as though he's God. What did Jesus do to make that kind of impression on them? And how do you explain how this band of scared disciples hiding out in the upper room for you know, fear of their life, all of a sudden, overnight, become this courageous band of preachers who go out into the Roman world proclaiming that Jesus Christ is a resurrected Son of God? And they're willing to lay it down their life for it. In fact, they did lay down their lives for it. How do you explain that? What took place that explains this change, this transformation? Now, they say it's the resurrection. They say they believe in Jesus, in the Son of God, because of the resurrection and the miracles and other things that he did. But it's primarily the resurrection. If that is true, then everything's explained. If that is not true, then what is true that explains this? There's not any good alternatives. It's either true or it's false, and if it's false, it, it, it's either intentionally false, they, they're lying about it, or it's unintentionally false, they're believing a legend or something. But why would they lie about it? It sounds like they benefited from this. God, giant houses and Rolex watches and lived in giant mansions and whatever. No, they, they died for this. And there's not a record of any of them rescinding, and we would have that record if any of them had recanted their testimony. We would know about it. There's a lot of hostile witnesses that want to prove this thing wrong. So they can't be lying. So then the only other alternative is that they're sincere, but they're believing a lie. They're believing a legend or something. The trouble is that this isn't a story that's told long, long, long ago and far, far away about somewhere in another Netherland. No, this is a story about a very public figure, a contemporary of theirs they hung out with for three years. His brother is among the, the group of believers. How do you develop a legend about a guy becoming God when his brother's still there? Uh, and it's a public figure. These, these, they're preaching in the same vicinity that Jesus did his ministry. They don't have to prove that he exists. Everyone knows that. In fact, there's no record of the opponents even denying that Jesus did the miracles that he did. What they deny is that he did it by the power of God. And so it seems to me that we've got every reason in the world to believe that this is actually rooted in, in, in actual history. And to me, this is the greatest proof that Jesus Christ is, in fact, who the New Testament says he is. He is the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the Son of God, the Word of God, the Savior of the world, uh, the Creator God Almighty. Amen. Amen. And he's risen from the dead to bring us newness of life.